All right, thank you guys. I'm the host and humble narrator of the Counterflow podcast. My name is Buck Johnson and I'm the MC for this event. Thank you, Rebecca, for having me out here. And uh, it's funny, I started a political journey in the late 90s when, uh, I won't say how old I was, but it started with being interested in secession in the South. And now I'm Orthodox and all these years later, we're kind of combining all of this. So I'm, I'm extremely excited to introduce um, Dr. Donald Livingston. He is a retired professor of philosophy at Emory University is past fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities, University of Edinburgh, and founder and president of the Abbeville Institute, which is very cool. He serves on the editorial staff of Chronicles, one of my favorite magazines, a magazine of American culture, and he's the author of Hume's Philosophy of Com Common Life, and Philosophical Melancholy and Delirium, Hume's Pathology and Philosophy, excuse me, of Philosophy, both by University of Chicago Press. Livingston converted to Orthodoxy in 2012 and is a parisher, excuse me, parishioner at Holy Ascension Orthodox Church in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Dr. Dr. Livingston, come on up. Can you hear me okay? My voice is not always as strong as I'd like for it to be. Well, I too am very pleased to see such numbers here. I was a man of little faith. Uh, we just started this institute, and um, so this is a great joy. Thank you very much for coming. In this talk, I want to explore two questions. Why is the South by far the most religious part of America? And what reason is there to think that the South is an especially fertile ground for orthodoxy? The Pew Research Center uses the following factors to judge a state to be, quote, highly religious. Certainty of belief in God, frequency of prayer, attendance in Bible study, religious education, prayer with other adults, and the importance of religion in one's life. Of the 15 states, receiving the highest percentages, all are Southern, except Utah. Six of these are at the very top. Some 77% of the people of Alabama and Mississippi are highly religious. In second place is Tennessee with 73%, Louisiana 71%, South Carolina and Arkansas are tied at 70%. The least religious are five New England states. Only 33% of Massachusetts and New Hampshire are highly religious. Maine, Vermont, 34%. Compare that with Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Arkansas, Louisiana, Tennessee, where 70 to 77% are highly religious. Looks like you've got two countries. And that doesn't count the other Southerners in that fifth, number of 15 uh, who are pretty religious. A study by the Chronicle of Philanthropy in 2012 found that of the top 10 states with the highest percentage of giving money to charity from their adjusted uh, gross income, um, all were Southern, except for Utah. The, the highest was uh, the, the next five highest in order or Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, and South Carolina. Five New England states, along with New Jersey, were at the bottom. Why is the South the most religious part of America, and the rest so secular? I don't really know the answer to that. I think it's known only to God, but I'm going to suggest some things that might help us understand it. Uh, there was an observation that I noticed by historian Richard Brown, who said, quote, with the defeat of the Confederacy, the ideal of a traditional society was erased from national life. 
end quote. The opposite of a traditional society is a modern society. But what is the difference between these two societies? Why is the one religious and the other not? Now, the, we have, we have um, the good fortune to have two thinkers in the 17th century, one of which is Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, English thinker, who gave us the paradigm statement of what a modern state is. Now, by the way, well, a modern state, the, the idea of modernity is only not even four centuries old. Think about that. It's very recent. And it's, that's just the idea and in its present form, no older than the French Revolution. So this is a recent thing in history. All, all, all societies in history have been traditional societies. The, the second philosopher is an Italian, Gian Battista Vico, V-I-C-O, Vico. He gives us the paradigmatic statement of what a traditional society is. Uh, Hobbes', Hobbes is great work was the Leviathan was published in 1651, and Vico's The New Science was published in 1722. Now, let's start with Hobbes. He assumes that man is motivated only by self-interest. He can do good for others, but only if it's, selfish, if it's in his self-interest. To do so. If there's no outside force, Beings of this kind must live in constant fear of anarchy, because there's nothing internally to uh, prevent it, and of a sudden and violent death. But there is a rational technological solution. Each individual, through enlightened self-interest, is willing to give up the unlimited exercise of his will to a man or group of men having the sole use of coercion to rule over them, or to protect them from each other. And that's the beginning of the modern state. In this state, it's, uh, the modern state is kind of like traffic regulations. You know, people just go wherever they want to go, no one cares, but just uh, stop at the red light. This Hobbesian state does not have God, virtue, or human excellence as part of its public space. It might be there, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not necessary. For Vico, society is not an artificial thing, as it is for Hobbes, made up by men, but a natural thing uh, that evolves and springs from fear, not of each other, but of gods. In this view, man moves from the animal to the human state, becomes human, only when he develops three institutions, religion, marriage, and burial. With these three, we have social memory and the lineaments of a traditional society. The Greeks, for example, taught that memory gave birth to the nine muses, which are the gods of the arts and sciences of culture. Once formed, human society develops through three stages. The first stage is the age of divinity. Primitive man, little more than an animal, is terrified by the rolling thunder. He points his finger to the sky and calls it Jove. Jove is the thunder. So mankind's first speech for Vico in understanding the world is a poetic act, a metaphor, where two things that are incompatible are joined to reveal something thought to be real. But this metaphor is also a universal because Jove continues to exist when the thunder is not heard. Vico calls this the poetic universal or the imaginative universal. Now, religious language explains reality through such metaphors. God is our father. Christ is fully God and fully man, a metaphorical universals holding together what is incompatible in experience. Now, the second stage is that of the founders and heroes who give laws, build cities, and guard the altars and places of divination. It is an age in which a hierarchy of virtue and human excellence begins to appear. 
But building cities requires critical thinking about causation. And the metaphysical universal is not very helpful. So what people do is they abstract the universal regularities from the particulars and opposites of the metaphorical uh, universal. And this move enables us to go from building by rule of thumb and trial and error to building with the self-evident axioms and theorems of Euclidean geometry. And see the difference. And Vico calls this the intelligible universal. Now, this sounds very abstract, but it's, it's going to come down to, to Earth in a little while. The intelligible universal. It's intelligible because all of the oppositions and particularities are, are, are cut out just for the one-dimensional uh, service of technology. Now, this discovery leads to the third age, which Vico calls the age of men, equality. And it is an age of decline. The age of men arises when the intelligible universal that makes technology possible is taken to be the sole source of wisdom. The metaphorical universal that held together opposites no longer makes sense to the Hobbesian technological mind, nor do the moral and religious traditions founded in the first two ages. So we get secularization and modernity uh, uh, with the appearance of the age of men and the dominance of the intelligible universal. Now, the, this purge of the metaphorical universal from rational discourse was precisely the move made by Rene Descartes, uh, commonly called the father of modern philosophy. He argued that true rational inquiry should begin by abandoning tradition, which is uncritically received on authority in favor of propositions that demonstrably self-evident. In this way, inquiry is sure to start off on the right path and make progress. Descartes warned, however, and this is something people forget, that this tradition-free method of inquiry should be applied only to mathematics, physics, and metaphysics. It should not be applied to religion, morals, and politics. But a year after Descartes' death in 1650, Hobbes would apply Descartes' method of wiping the slate clean of tradition in order to explain the moral and political world. And not too much longer uh, later, Thomas Paine will be publishing Hobbesism for the people. A century later after Hobbes, the great Scottish philosopher David Hume observed something really new had happened in Europe. He said there were now political parties devoid of any critical engagement with tradition and custom and based on nothing other than abstract philosophical principle. And he said, and I quote, these parties are unique to modern times. He wrote this in 1748. And are the most unaccountable phenomenon that has yet to appear in human affairs, end quote. So, so it, he's seeing something new. Vico calls this Hobbesian application of Descartes' tradition for inquiry into morals and politics, quote, the barbarism of reflection or the barbarism of the intellect. And I'm going to talk a lot about this barbarism of reflection. It is a form of barbarism because the intelligible universal acts as an acid that eats away at the substance of the metaphorical universals that founded the traditional societies of virtue in the first two ages of human society. Vico was the first to systematically explore, explore this pathology of intellect that's plagued modern society throughout its less than four century history. It's still very much with us. And I want to examine two forms of this barbarism of the intellect that has brought confusion. The first is the modern doctrine of natural rights. 
The second is what I call a total critique of society. The goal of both is to build a universal civilization on a theory that is or should be self-evident to all rational beings. The era of both, in Solzhenitsyn's words, is that they have forgotten God. Now, the American version of natural rights, we're all familiar with, is that it's self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed with inalienable rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Since men are evidently not equal in a hundred different respects, everything depends on explaining in what respect are they all equal? In what respect? And there's no agreement because the term equality in the formula is indeterminate. It's open, it has to be interpreted. And there's no agreement on how to interpret it. I'll just run through a few. Uh, for Hobbes, the required equality is that men are equally egoist, equally fear each other, and equally able to kill each other. So we need a state. For male, men are equally equal in feeling pleasure and pain, but then so are the animals. For Kant, men are equal in being able to recognize that immoral maxims are self-defeating. So what? Murderers don't worry about that. Oh, God, I contradicted myself. Shouldn't do that. None of these contrary views or interpretations provide an account of the dignity human beings have to have uh, to motivate and authorize belief in universal right, human rights. Now, the biblical teaching that man is made in the image of God and because of that each individual has intrinsic dignity and worth does provide for such an account. But it is not acceptable in Vico's age of men because this is a teaching that springs from metaphorical um, universals. And so it's not um, intelligible. For example, the Constitution of the European Union, for instance, uh, pointedly excludes any reference to the contribution made by Christian tradition in forming European civilization. It's just not there. Wiped out, here brushed out. Since there is no agreement on the relevant sense in which men are all equal required for natural rights, almost anything that power and lack of shame can assign could be a natural right. For example, the innocent institution of marriage was held by the Supreme Court and Obergfell v. Hodges to be an oppressive institution because it violated the equality principle by excluding same-sex couples. You can't find a better example of the barbarism of reflection than that court ruling. I turn now to the total critique of society. This pathology arises when one becomes obsessed with a certain class of natural rights, observes that they are not universally enjoyed in society and concludes that this is due to the structure of society itself. For example, the French philosopher Pierre Joseph Proudhon wrote a book called What is Property? And he concluded that property is theft. Now in common life, see this inverts moral language, in common life, theft is taking one's property. How can property be theft? Only if you have a Gnostic meaning of what property really is. Can you say that? So you see, Gnosticism is alive in the doctrine of the total critique and also in natural rights. This brings to mind, this in inversion of moral language brings to mind the story of King Midas, who being obsessed with gold, wished for and received the power to turn whatever he touched into gold. He didn't reckon though that this would ruin his dinner, his garden and kill his beloved daughter. Likewise, Marx was obsessed with class struggle and the wrong done by private property. He wrote, quote, we are not interested in reforms of class conflict, but in the elimination of classes. Not in reforming private property, but in its elimination, end quote. Marx was endowed with a power similar to that of King Midas. Likewise, everything a certain kind of feminist touches is transformed into patriarchal tyranny. Everything the critical race theorist touches 
is transformed into structural white supremacy. And all these barbarisms of the intellect, reform is rejected as a laughable rearrangement of the power structure. Now, Vico distinguishes the barbarism of the intellect from the barbarism of sense, barbarism of sense. The Romans, like the mafia, killed, conquered, and lived by tribute. And they took pride in doing so. The barbarism of the intellect, however, is able to advert the meaning of moral language so that perversion, robbery, and murder are transmuted into acts of human liberation. You see the difference? In the age of man, we enter a topsy-turvy world where property can be theft, where a man can have himself sculpted into the shape of a woman and by right compete in women's sports, and where the innocent institution of marriage is put on trial, forced to justify itself as an existential reality. Vico gives us a memorable description of a, what will become a modern society in which the barbarism of reflection has reached, quote, the extreme delicacy, or better of pride, pride, in which like wild animals, they bristle and lash out at the slightest displeasure. Thus, no matter how great the throng and press of their bodies, they live like wild beasts, in a deep solitude of spirit and will, scarcely any two being able to agree. This passage describes much of mainstream America today, which in having abandoned tradition and necessarily God has taken on the character of the modern state of Hobbes and is in an advanced state of the barbarism of reflection. It also highlights the South as the most religious part of America. Now, how did this dichotomy come about? How did we get this south? After independence, the North began turning itself into a commercial and manufacturing sector. John Adams remarked of his section that avarice was greater there than anywhere in the world. With the Industrial Revolution, one cannot exaggerate the sense in which making money, industrial development, and technological progress became a religion in the North, justifying almost anything. Complete, I should add, with clerical support. Eugene Genovese, historian who, who was described by the Atlantic Monthly in the 1990s as America's greatest living historian, argued that the antebellum South was not a version of Northern capitalism. The South created a semi-feudal, paternalistic economic system that was unique among slave societies in the Western Hemisphere. It participated in a global capitalist market, but unlike the North, did not embody the ideology of that system. Instead of making money as the mark of virtue and social status, the South defined virtue by a man's civic activity Instead of plowing profits back into making even more money, wealthy planters consumed profits to improve life on their plantations and to extend their holdings in a network of kinship and community relations. Uh, slaves had cradled to grave welfare, paternalism. Uh, slavery was wrong, but, but paternalism mitigated it somewhat. They favored the values of hierarchy honor, noblesse oblige, chivalry, amiability, and hospitality to strangers. Alexander Stevens, vice president of the Confederacy, for example, uh, had a room in his house, always open to strangers. Critics then and now, assuming that Northern industrial society was the norm for all Americans, have ridiculed this society as non-existent with its semi-medieval character, as romantic fantasy caused by reading Walter Stott too often. But that ignores the fact that these pre-modern dispositions were planted by the first settlers of Virginia in 1607 
before the founders of modern thought, Descartes, Galileo, Bacon, Hobbes, and Locke, have even begun writing. As of 1860, the South had been cultivating a semi-medieval traditional society for two and a half centuries. That's a long enough to plant it. Richard Weaver, culture, cultural, cultural critic Richard Weaver, describes the antebellum South as, quote, the last non-materialistic civilization in the West. Genovese also points out that the antebellum South worked out the first substantial native critique of the evils of 19th century capitalism. And Southern writers were also the first Americans to construct a sustained, sophisticated critique of the modern state's tendency to totalitarianism, which Genovese observes, quote, has run amok in the 20th century, end quote. The myth that Southerners were anti-intellectual has been exploded by Oxford scholar Michael O'Brien. In 1830, the College of South Carolina had more non-theological books in its library than Harvard. And a private lending library nearby had more books than the college. With only a third of the national population, nearly three times as many young Southerners went to college as in the North. Nearly three times. The first college in America to give women advanced degrees was Wesleyan College in Macon, Georgia in 1836. Southern students studied the Greek and Latin classics in the original languages and had to recite in them. The classics were studied in the North mainly for academic purposes, but in the South, they were part of an education designed to teach virtue and were studied by Christians as a moral engagement and emulation of the best in classical culture. I've been told that Lee could give the Greek exam at Washington College. A full-scale replica of the Parthenon exists today in Nashville, Tennessee, built in 1897 as a mute tribute to classical learning. Though unhappily, modern students in Nashville no longer read their Greek. The merit of a society consists in the kind of moral character it produces. Northern critics after the war harshly criticized the kind of character the crass materialism of their society was producing. Three distinguished Northern writers, Henry Adams, Henry James and Herman Melville admired the classical Christian character of the South and in their novels used ex-Confederates who had moved north as a moral contrast to the corruption, shams, and money-obsessed life of the Gilded Age. Of this age, Kenneth Stamp, a northerner and one of the, one of the memorable Civil War historians of the 20th century, wrote, that though the North professed noble ideals, all it achieves, he said, quote, was the shabby aristocracy of the North and the ragged children of the South. In response to the Great Depression, now we zip to the 1920s, 12 Southerners, literary and cultural critics, called the Nashville Agrarians, published a manifesto in 1930 entitled, I'll Take My Stand. The essays were a protest against the material acquisitiveness, spiritual disorder, and absor absorption of the individual into a mass society that they associate with industrialism, economic, and political centralization. Like the Old South, they insisted on an economic system that was neither modern state capitalism nor socialism. Like Jefferson, they favored a wide distribution of landed property for family farms that would generate economically independent citizens needed for a real republic, living in villages and small towns at a human scale as they had once enjoyed before the war. As a political movement, the national agrarians failed flat. But I'll take my stand has never gone out of print. Why is that? 
It was more than about reforming agri the agricultural South. It was about affirming the humanistic ideal of a traditional society of the sort that Vico explained to us. And is read today by kindred spirits around the world. President Jimmy Carter himself, a small town Southern farmer, carried on this Southern critique, of I'll take my stand, um, uh, of, of, of American modernity. And he did this in his inaugural address and later in the famous speech given from the White House where he said the following. Too many of us now tend to worship self-indulgence and consumption. Human identity is no longer defined by what one does, but what one owns. But we've discovered that owning things and consuming things does not satisfy our longing for meaning. We've learned that piling up material goods cannot fill the emptiness of lives that have no confidence or purpose." End quote. Now this was what the North was saying to the South, in antebellum times, Southerners would say, Yankees know how to make money, we know how to spend it. We spend it well. And it was how the agrarians were talking to the rest of the country in 1930. So this tradition continues. Um, but Carter's speech Oh, yes, and he contrasts today with a nation, quote, that was proud of hard work, strong families, close-knit communities, and our faith in God. And this is Vico all over again. This speech was ridiculed as his, quote, malaise speech. Americans were not interested in retarding the pace of material acquisition, even though paid for largely by public and private debt. And shop till you drop has continued. When faced with the loss of national confidence um, caused by 9-11, President George W. Bush urged that the patriotic thing to do was to go out and shop. Remember that? There's, I couldn't believe it. Uh, there, there is a bumper sticker that says, quote, whoever dies with the most toys wins. My answer to the question why is the South the most religious part of the country? Is that it did not follow the North's revolutionary path to become a Hobbesian modern state, rooted in a radical notion of individualism, a, 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 a tradition, a tradition-free notion of individualism. The traditionalist dispositions outlined by Vico were planted in Virginia in 1607, and as I said, were cultivated for two and a half centuries. And that's why the South is the most religious. Traditional societies are necessarily religious, and the South is the only section in America that for a long period of time, its whole history, up to 1860, cultivated a traditional society. And they could do that because America had a federal system, also there was no central government to interfere. They could just do it. It's not possible now. Practically. That, that society was destroyed politically by the Union victory, by the imprint of a traditional way of life guided by belief in God, strong families, and a human scale of political order has survived and is still a vital bond of Southern identity. Amy Bradford defines Southern identity, quote, as a vital, long-lasting bond, a corporate identity assumed among those who have contributed to it, which means it is not a nativist or ethnic thing. You don't have to be born in the South to be part of this tradition. Flannery O'Connor says Southern identity was a mystery known only to God, but she thought if you wanted to understand it, it was best done through literature. And this meant through the metaphorical universal. O'Connor was not modern in rejecting Vico's metaphorical universal for, uh, in favor of the intelligible universal. Um, when the Eucharist was described as a symbol in a discussion with Northern literary critics, she replied, if it's a symbol, the hell with it. <laughs> and that sort of woke people up. 
Where's that girl from? When O'Connor was, okay, I've already read that. Um, when she was asked how to explain the brilliant outpouring of Southern literature of the 20th century and its ability to penetrate the human heart, she replied, it's because we lost the war, end quote. The South suffered national and constitutional collapse, something known to other people in the world, but not to the rest of America. The South, this chasing experience of total defeat strengthens the imprint of a traditional society in the South's historical memory. This memory is different from the rest of the country. And it renders it a, a fertile ground, I think, for orthodoxy. Alan Tate observed, and I'll take my stand, that the South built a feudal society without having a feudal religion. By this he meant that, though a Protestant culture, the South has developed a sacramental view of life, but without a sacramental religion to articulate it. Tate knew this because he converted from Protestantism to Catholicism and discovered something in its sacramental life and discovered in its sacramental life something which, as a Southerner, he had long been familiar. The same could be said, I think, of Walker Percy's conversion to Catholicism. And Flannery O'Connor, who was born Catholic and was Southern, knew well the, the, the sacramental disposition of Southerners. I don't want to make too much of that, but it is a part of the character. After the war, Southerners were understandably confused about their American and their Southern identity. They thought the Constitution allowed states to secede, just like in the European Union. So they were Americans when they seceded. Now all of a sudden, they, they're, not, they're not they're Americans, so what are they? As they drew closer to God, they came to see their defeat as a blessing because it enabled them to receive that wisdom which only humility, suffering, and reliance on God can provide. This new identity was put in a popular maxim, which reads as follows, quote, American by birth, Southern by the grace of God. Well, I should bring you up short. What does that mean? It was this grace that President Carter had in mind when in speeches to Southern audiences, he would say, quote, I am proud to be an American, but prouder still to be a Southerner, end quote. Flannery O'Connor said 70 years ago that the South is not Christ-centered, but it is certainly Christ-haunted. A recent country music song expresses that insight in this way. Johnny's got on his arm two tattoos. The stars and bars and born to lose. And the South ain't gonna rise again, but we're holding out for Jesus. At least that's what they say on AM radio. <laughs> the person who wrote this song is now working on his doctorate in theology at Oxford University. Southern literature is distinctive and has received global recognition. Faulkner was awarded the Nobel Prize and the French gave him the Legion of Honor. But Southern music has received a more extensive global audience. Dr. Tom Daniel, a historian of American music, says that, that, um, that any music you hear in the world with an American sound is likely of Southern origin. Not necessarily, but likely. He has classified over 30 genres of music created by Southerners, black and white. He says three or four genres would have been impressive, but over 30 requires some explanation, which we'll leave for another day. But a good deal of that music spiritualizes the imprint of a traditional society that is at the heart of Southern identity. It's about mama, it's about getting drunk, it's about railroads. 
It's about, it's about adultery. It's about, it's about love of land. The antebellum South was personified by a female and was viewed as the motherland, not the fatherland. Whereas the North identified with the male figure who had built and managed the engines of progress. Many Southern songs express a longing to return to the motherland and a lost traditional society. And that land is often identified even with the states. How did they get that dignity? Consider John Denver's song, Country roads take me home to the place where I belong. West Virginia, Mountain Mama, take me home. And there's Sweet Home Alabama and Ray Charles' song of Georgia. Just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind. And, and uh, Denver's song, uh, West Virginia, is said to be, quote, almost heaven. End quote. Or take this passage. You walked across my heart like it was Texas. You taught me how to say it, just don't care. Now try to plug in the words Illinois. <laughs> First of all, nobody in Illinois would even imagine writing such a song. And the reason is, Illinois is a good place, but, and I lived there for 15 years, wonderful people. Um, but, not all places have been spiritualized. Not all places have been washed in the blood. Not all places have been poetized. But the very words Alabama is poetic. Georgia, Virginia, these, these, uh, these evoke uh, song and story. That's why so much music has come out of the South and so much splendid literature has come out of the South. When Southern humorist Louis Grizzard, who had been living up north, secured a writing column in the Atlantic Constitu Atlanta Constitution, and was able to return to the motherland, he said he knelt and kissed the ground, resolving never to leave again. If this, if this Protestant Southern humorist could kiss the red clay of Georgia, then with a little catechumen education, it would not be a great step to venerate an icon of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thank you.